Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We are live on YouTube at Adesa Week and also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSFA Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okansi Tonight. Your election command center has officially been launched on TV3 and 3FM and 3news.com. Exactly 100 days to election 2024, December 7. Promising facts, analysis and results in programming ahead of the December 7 polls. We have some highlights for you and also a conversation tonight. Hard times for the Ghanaian economy as public debt now stands at over 760 billion cities. You might be wondering how much you owe in them. Well, the Minister of Finance saying that the depreciation of the city is largely to blame for the increase in the public debt. But is that really the case? Is that all there is to it? We'll have a conversation tonight. Stay with us. And we continue to assess the dynamics in the swing regions and how they will likely affect the outcome of the December poll. Poster Musa Dankwa will be joining us here on Ghana tonight as we shift from the Western region yesterday to the Great Accra region. We'll tell you how the dynamics have been over the period from 1996 right up to now and also what the story within the trends say and why the year 2020 still remains an outlier for a lot of the polls that stay with us here on your election common center as always you're an integral part of the conversation let's hear from you the hashtag we're using is gonna tonight on facebook and on x let's get talking Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam has announced the release of a first tranche of 700 million cities bailout to persons whose funds were locked up after the financial sector cleanup exercise. The amount forms part of the 1.5 billion cities fund, earlier approved by cabinet, to settle customers of the defunct fund management companies. Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam was speaking at a press briefing organized by his outfit. 1.5 billion Ghana cities will be released in three tranches. This amount will bring the number of investors to be fully settled under the Black Shield Limited to 82,096 customers, representing 92%, and to 12,069 customers, representing 78% of the rest of the fund management companies. The illegal mining activity being conducted along the Konongo Accra Highway has been halted after intensified media reports. Those satisfied with the intervention, residents want a sustained plan to prevent the miners from returning to the site. Uh, I am sure that you bear with me that fighting these illegal miners is not something all that easy. We are doing our best and I know that uh, the Air Force, that the music have you know, putting in place will, will help us solve it uh, gradually. It shall be way. And we are committed to make sure that the right thing is being done. The recombination activity is being paid by the taxpayer. So we shouldn't allow this to go waste by allowing the miners back. Driving on principal roads in the capital continues to expose motorists to danger, especially in the night. The alarming rise in non-functioning street lights has reduced visibility as major roads have been plunged in pitch darkness. Experts are concerned and demanding urgent action to prevent fatalities as the elections approach. This are uh, a part of the engineering of our roads and if this is not there, of course we should have a lot more of accidents on our road. We are high on ensuring that vehicles that move around at night have improved visibility so that they do not suffer uh, the consequences of uh, the already compounded situation. <laughs> 
Earlier on Thursday afternoon, Black Stars head coach Utu Ado announced a 23-man squad ahead of the 2025 Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers against Angola and Niger. You would ask me of one of those players who are on the squad, why are they left out? So I know it's your job and you have to ask and I respect that, but the truth is, like, I always try to get the best team on which I think we can win, and that's all. And if they play, wherever they play, it doesn't matter. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. As always, we're an integral part of the conversation. Let's hear from you. The hashtag we're using is Ghana Tonight on Facebook and on X. Let's get talking. Coming up next on Ghana Tonight, in case you missed it, we officially launched our election coverage here on uh, TV3 and also on 3FM 92.7. Um, this is your election command center, the 2024 coverage of the election on December 7. And already, you know, we bring you exactly what you need to know. We've been putting out programs and conversations and content ahead of today. We have the uh, constituency watch and also community manifesto that we're bringing the microphones to your doorstep in your community for you to have a say in what we say in shaping governance and also demanding what you deserve in this democracy. So earlier today, under the leadership of the group CEO of Media Journal, Madam Beatrice Ajiman, we officially launched the coverage of the 2024 general elections here on your election command center. Let's take a look at this. On behalf of the board, management and staff of Media General, I hereby declare the coverage of the elections at the ECC duly launched. Exactly what is going to represent our coverage. That's the symbol. That's the logo. This is your election command center. Everything you saw on that logo that was unveiled today has a meaning. It represents the values, the commitment to bringing you everything you need to know going into this election 2024. And already we've started a number of programs that have set the pace for what we intend to do here on your election command center with manifesto check here on Ghana tonight, hosted by my colleague Dennis Barberi Wadam, one of the segments on this show where we've been analyzing the manifestos of uh, the NDC and the NPP over the period, and then also the young voters' voices we've been bringing to you. But the general manager in charge of news, Astu Sahiyabale, also had a few words to share earlier today. Take a look. And as some of our audiences would have noticed so far, we've started a lot of community engagement with some constituencies and communities. Community Manifesto on TV3 and also Community Watch on 3FM are such initiatives. The objective is to ensure that the good people of Ghana get heard. The objective is to ensure that whilst we give the opportunity and engage the political actors, we also hear what the good people of Ghana say. They are our focus. So as part of this drive, we are going to launch the Use Your Voice campaign. This hashtag will be activated across our platforms to ensure that the good people of Ghana are heard. Because at the end of the day, 
they are the reason why we do elections. As, as to Sahihablethe, and we had a number of civil society organizations, political parties, one of the major stakeholders in this election also heavily represented. We put them all together, the MPP, the NDC, the CPP, we also had the Center for Democratic Development, CDD, and also uh, uh, the Movement for Change, all represented earlier today. Take a look. We cannot go into an election in any manner of violence that would threaten the stability of this nation. So I would like to call on all of us, Ghanaians, to stop hate speech. As a political party, we can assure you of our partnership. Your journalists will be safe around our premises and as we tour this country. And that is the assurance that I will give to you Alan wants to send a message to all of us that we are at a very critical junction as a nation and that our development is not just about political parties. It is about leadership that will bring great transformation to our nation. I want to say that as the CPP goes for our Congress to choose our flag bearer, the cycle will be complete. By the 4th of September, the CPP will choose a flag bearer who will compete on our behalf. I want to say that we need peace. The media is going to be very important, particularly in educating voters as we go into the election. A lot of the challenges we have is just because people lack knowledge on even basic things like voting procedures. So we should use all our mediums, both uh, English language, local language, to educate people as much as we can. And this is it. We remain your election command center. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing for the next 100 days. When you see that, it tells you what the conversation is going to be next here on your election command center across all media general platforms. Today, as we've started the conversation on the swing regions, yesterday we touched a bit on the western region there are four swing regions now that we're going to be looking at for the next couple of weeks ahead of us um, doing the analysis of how the trends have been and what exactly the projection is but the polls conducted by the likes of global fund electors one of our major partners going into this election Musa Danko is going to be joining us shortly but we have the western north the western region the greater Accra region the central region these four regions are going to be our focus because as we have seen in the trends since 1996 at the least the persons who win these regions, all things being equal, are declared president of the Republic of Ghana. But the year 2020 was an outlier, and I'm going to show you why shortly. In the Greater Accra region, that's the swing region that we're focusing on today here on your election command center. Take a look at this. In the Greater Accra region, for the presidential election over the period, look critically at the year 1996. And the NDC won the Greater Accra region for the presidential elections with 54% as against the NPP 43.3. And then in the year 2000, the MPP won. And bear in mind, in 1996, the NDC won the presidential with the late Jerry John Rawlings. In the year 2000, Johnny Jacum Kufour won that presidential election on the ticket of the NPP. And then they won the Great Accra region. 2004, the MPP won the presidential, Jay Kufour won, and the MPP won the Great Accra region. Let's look at 2008. The NDC won 2008 after a runoff with John Evans at the mills, 52.1%. In 2012, John Dramani Mahama won the presidential, and the NDC won the Greater Accra region. Also in the parliamentary, and I'm going to show you that in a bit, in 2012, 52.3%. But you take note of the gap between them. 
in 2008, it was 46 to 52, mm -hmm. just around the same margin in the year 2012. In 2016, you see the MPP coming back to win it with 52.4% with Donato Danko Ekufuado winning that election as well as President of the Republic of Ghana. They won the Greater Accra region. In the year 2020, look at what happened. The NDC won the Greater Accra region in the presidential. John Dramani Mahama won the presidential in the Greater Accra region with 51.04% and the NPP trailed with some 48.1 percent but as we have seen in the trends from 1996 as you see on the screen there even though John Dramani Mahama won the presidential in the Greater Accra region with superior votes he did not win a presidency he wasn't declared president of the Republic of Ghana so in the year 2020 a number of the things that happened through a lot of the trends that we have seen in elections since 1996 off gear and off board. And that's why you have a lot of people questioning some of the things that happened in the year 2020 elections. And to the extent that this brought to question some of the trends that we have seen over the period. It's not just the presidential. If you look at the parliamentary as well, the NDC won the parliamentary in the Greater Accra region. And that follows the trend that when you win presidential, win parliamentary, you definitely will become president if you win the Greater Accra region. Look at that. In 1996, the NDC won 13 seats as against the MPP's nine seats. 2000, the MPP got superior seats in the Greater Accra region with 15 seats. 2004, they maintained their lead, even though the NDC closed it a bit with some 11 seats in there. In 2008, the NDC claimed its hold in the Greater Accra region again. And then in 2012, they maintained that hold and look at 2016, the MPP overturned the NDC's hold of the Greater Accra region with 21 seats as against the NDC's 13 seats. But take a look at 2020, the year 2020. The NDC won 20 seats in the Greater Accra region, the MPP with 14 seats. But yet, they did not win the presidential. I mean, I'm talking about the national presidential election for John Mahama to be declared president. So... A number of things happened. Now we go to Musa Dankwa, I suppose. He's been doing since April and, and July. And we're doing this month on month analysis to project into the next three months what he's going to be doing as well. Musa Dankwa is joining us now as a director of Global Info Analytics. Musa Dankwa, I appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight. I see um, in the poll that you put out um, for the month of April and the month of July, it tells a story. And we're focusing on the greater Accra region. I see that in April, you asked a specific question that if the elections were held in April, who are the people that you polled going to vote for? 21% of those who responded in April said they were going to vote for Dr. Mahmoud Bamiya. 73% of them said they were going to vote for John Dramani Mahama. Fast forward to July, just last month, 31% of those who responded to the poll in the Greater Accra region by a global info analytics said they were going to vote for John, that's Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, and 64% said they were going to vote for John Dramani Mahama. So there is some reduction in between 73 and 64 between April and July for John Mahama, but yet still he holds the majority in the greater Accra region per the polls that you put out, Mr. Dankwa. But then again, we see also a 10% jump for Dr. Mahmoud Bayamia between April and July in the greater Accra region. But then again, the NDC still has that majority hold per the polls that you put out. And this is why I bring you in, Mr. Dankwa, because we see a number of things happening in, in the year 2020 elections, where even though per the trends, anybody who wins the presidential in the Greater Accra region as a swing region, and his or her party wins the parliamentary or majority seat in the Greater Accra region, eventually becomes the president of the Republic of Ghana, as we've seen in a number of the swing regions that are more of kin makers. It didn't happen in the year 2020. More of an outlier, you would say? And, and, and what happened from where you, where you sat? Hey. Um, when you, if you call it an outlier, uh, in terms of uh, it didn't fall in the same line as it did in the past that is going to the winner of the eventual race. Yes, in that case, it's an outlier. But the result actually is not an outlier result. Result, 
But then again, you see the pattern, at least based on the trend that we've seen over the period, those trends were altered. Is it not? Based on at least from 1996 to 2020. Yes. And I think um, if you looked at the results of the 2020 elections, I think it was a lot closer than people thought it was going to be. And that happened because of Great Accra, largely because uh, Jim Mahama won Great Accra in a way that I think they, they didn't expect them uh, to win it. I see. But I see in your poll that, that you put out, um, at least for the month of April, between the month of April and July, there's some interesting development in there. And I want you to, to just get that into the detail of how between April and July, there's that difference of 21 to 31 percent for Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, and then that drop of 73 to 64 percent for uh, John Mahama in the Great Accra region, per the people that you polled. Yes, um, certainly. Um you look at the data we have currently, uh, look at April and July. Uh, April, uh, John Mama was around 73%, quite high numbers. And then Baumia was 21% and Alan 5%, and Bidiakun 1%. But in July, you know, Ju July was the peak of the uh, Baumia store. So you would expect uh, a bit of bump to happen for him in July. So in July, we saw him improve in Greater Accra by almost 10 points, from 21 to 30, uh, 31%. And Mahama drops nearly, uh, I think, 11% or thereabouts. So yes, it, it, it is not unexpected following the uh, round of campaign that DMB had earlier embarked on. I, I, but still quite high in terms of how Accra has, has been, voted, uh, been voting in the past. These numbers are extreme uh, high numbers for, for, for GM in the Greater Accra region. I see. But, but, but based on your own analysis, and the, I know you're doing another poll that is going to be out in the next two months. Um, that's a month before the elections. But based on the initial uh, results that you're picking, is there going to be any significant change in what we are seeing for the month of July? Because... Between April and July, you see an increase of 10% for Dr. Mahmoud Bomia and some drop of about most 9% for John Dramani Mahama. Is that trend of decline going to continue? Is there going to be any significant change from what you see here, an appreciation and, and decline? Yes, I don't expect the British Accra uh, to change dramatically. Uh, the reason being that the number of MPP voters who are switching to John Mahama is quite high. Um, if you look at the, uh, and also people who in 2020 voted for Nado, but now voting for John Mahama is quite high. If you look at the July poll, about 35% of voters who in 2020 went for Nado are doing time around, 35%. That is a huge swing. And only 58% of Nado's voters are voting for Baumia in the Greater Accra region. 4% are voting for Alan and 3% are voting for Nanakwa and Bidiago. But in the case of uh, John Mahama, uh, he gets 96% of people in Greater Accra who voted for him last time. Only 3% have switched to vote for uh, Dr. Ba Mahmoud Baumia and 1% are voting for Alan. But among those who did not vote, which includes the first-time voters and other older voters who couldn't vote for one reason or the other. Sixty-seven percent of them are voting for John Bahama, compared to fifteen percent for Nana, uh, for uh, Doctor Baumia, and fourteen percent for Alan Martin, and four percent for Nana Kwambidiabo. So you could see what is driving Mahama's numbers. It's entirely the switch from MPP uh, from those voters to Mahama. And again, strongly among first-time voters and those who didn't vote in Greater Accra. Pretty interesting. Thank you. Mr. Dankwa, appreciate your time on this. And we're going to keep an eye on this and how things play out in the next two months when you put out your final poll ahead of election 2024. This is your election command center, the focus in the Greater Accra region, one of the major swing regions that we've seen um, over the period in this election in this country. But in 2020, saw some changes. Dr. Musadankwa has given us an idea of how things are playing out already 
in the greater Accra region and the NDC's hold in that region as well. We'll see how the coming days and months will look like. But this is your election command center coming up next. The minority is reacting to a request by the finance minister for the release of some 500 million CDs from the contingency fund. That's what's up coming up next here on Ghana tonight. If you recall, a couple of days ago, when your great minister uh, made that bold explanation and then also the justification for the $500 million that has been asked for to, to address these matters related to the impact of the dry spill in some eight regions. Following up to that, the finance minister is asking parliament to grant him access to the contingency fund for some 500 million cities. And that's where the minority in parliament, in fact, the minority on the finance committee are raising questions about that particular demand. Here's what we know about the impact of the spell, this dry spell that we're experiencing in the last couple of weeks in eight regions. Take a look at this. The food shortage that is being feared, the loss of farmer investment income, and the decline in GDP, and also an increase in, in security threats and extremism. This is what, according to the agri minister, could possibly be the case. And he puts the number of farmers who have been affected to 900,000. One of the justifications for this amount of money being asked for. And then also the specific measures that they say, if they get the money, they will do is to mop up shortages, urgent importation of grains and cash transfers, input support to affected farmers um, and amongst others. But Let's, let's hear from the Agri Minister, Brian Champong, when he was speaking to my colleague, Parkwes Yassari, about the justification for this $500 million to address this impact of the dry spell. Take a look. Calculate the fertilizer that you need, mm. okay, which is about a little, two, about 2,100, mm. and then you multiply by the number of acres. acres okay, we estimated about $268 million that is required to buy inputs. If you put that together, $268 million is more than $3 billion. Mm -hmm. So the actual amount required mm -hmm. is way more than $8 billion. Mm -hmm. And the reason is this. You can, we cannot fully compensate the farmers for all their investment loss. So that's our great minister. There. Let's go on to Zoom now. Uh, the member of parliament for the Cape Coast South constituency, a former deputy finance minister, is joining us on Zoom, George Kweko Rickett Hagan. Honorable, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. First off, I want to understand why uh, you're the minority. Uh, you're raising questions about the request that the finance minister is making of you, parliament, essentially to grant him access to the contingency fund for some 500 million cities to address this dry spell impact in the eight regions? Well, uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Alfred, and uh, good evening to your, to your viewers and uh, your listeners. Um, yes, um, it is not the issue of the, the, the dry spell that uh, we are trying to stop the government from addressing. It is obviously to do with the timing of this request that the finance minister is making um, from the contingency fund and the other policy decisions that they are making surrounding um, <clears throat> this issue, the, the ban on, uh, on, on export of grains and, and other things and cutting of the budget of the Ministry of Agri itself and that of roads, I believe, to combat this this problem is is what we we have a bit of a problem with um <clears throat> first of all trying to take 500 million um from the contingency fund at this time when we are you know almost um, nearly um to the uh, election is a bit problematic it only suggests to us that a government is trying to do um what they did during the covid era it looks as if this government, when it's coming up to an election, needs some kind of a disaster to be able to, you know, siphon money um, from 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 our coffers to be able to fund the uh, the election. 
um, as as you know, we had a natural uh, a natural disaster um, during the COVID period in twenty twenty two election. Uh, there was a lot of COVID money that poured in, which ended up in in people's pocket to fund um, the the election. Now, come 2024, four years later, they are not seeing any such disaster in the horizon. Therefore, they will have to, you know, look for look for what they call a disaster to be able to take this money and obviously spend it on the election. The other issue is to do with this ban on, on export. I mean, Ghana is, when it comes to Food, we are actually a net importer of food. Therefore, we export very little. If you quite remember, another policy disaster not too long ago by the trade minister who wanted to ban importation of certain goods uh, uh, into this country, including these grains that we are talking about. Can you imagine if that has been allowed by the minority for it to go through? And we are confronted with the situation that they are telling us now that we are confronted, what would have been the situation? So it looks as if there is a, a knee-jerk reaction when it comes to you know, policies, especially emergency policies by this government. And they pretty much don't seem to know what they're doing. If you go to 2023 budget, they have put in this 2023 budget, or they had made provision for being able to come up with some, you know, uh, resilient type of seed, a drought resilient type of seed, you know, to be able to combat the very situation that we are facing at the moment. The question then becomes, what have they done or what did they do with that money that was um, allocated to, to, to do this uh, drought resilient uh, mm. seedling? Right. And then, second, why are they, I mean, nobody knows exactly the extent of what, what we are talking about. We've had news from, the, um, from our northern regions and the, and the affected regions uh, about, about what's going on there. Nobody here knows the severity of it. And how did they arrive by a quantum of 500, mi uh, 500 million to address you know, the, the problem? And who will be getting this 900 million, uh, 500 million? Sorry, we don't uh, want the a situation where it becomes uh, basically money going to, you know, cronies and, 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 and friends, and that this money will be allocated for farmers, but it, okay. will, it will not end up going to farmers, but will go to, you know, party. You, you you raised some questions about even where the money is going to go to and how it's going to be distributed. You're suspecting something more than just the farmers being supported by this or with this five hundred million dollars. According to the Agri Minister, this is what they, they intend to do with it. The specific measures as outlined: urgent importation of grains, cash transfers to the nine hundred thousand farmers that. He says that based on their own um, data collection, have been affected and support to these farmers, and then some mopping shortage as well. That's what he says. It's going to be, this $500 million is going to be used for, Honorable. Well, I, I mean, who, who has really quantified or crystallized these this numbers and tell us who is going to get what? You can't just come up and say you need $500 million and then for Parliament approve for you to take 500 million in an election year, a few months, about three, four months to an election, to embark on this, this exercise that we are, we, we are talking about, that uh, nobody really knows the extent of. And taking the money around this, I only suggest to, to ask that here we go again, the government is trying to use a disaster, in this case, a man-made disaster, to try and siphon government and money, you know, from 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 us, and uh, we must all be concerned that we want to try and keep spending within a certain limit. Yes, you can't help when you have a disasters and all that, but 
I am not quite sure that the amount of money they are asking for is the quantum of money they need to address the the problem. And and in that case, uh, the severity of of this problem, the problem is there. But how severe is the problem? And it, the severity is what you, you you also raise questions about. I get that. What you're essentially asking for is some further and better particulars of why this $500 million is being put forward as the money needed to address the impact of this dry spell in the eight regions and why the 500 million CDs is being asked for from the contingency fund. You want some further detail to justify this demand, is it not? <laughs> that, there, there, there we go again. How do we justify that? I mean, further and better particulars, as you said, you can't just call numbers in the air and expect that, you know, we approve for you to use that money, only to end up somewhere else. I hope you haven't forgotten 2020, when uh, uh, um, members of the MPP or executives of the MPP somewhere in the North were talking about monies, COVID monies that were given to them to share. It is going to go down the same route. I mean, we have seen it before. The 2021 was a natural disaster. Now they are using man-made disaster, you know, for pro profiteering or for money to fund the election. So, you know, the the the, the minister will have to come before before the finance committee or before the house to explain. We will be going back to the house on an emergency and on, on I think the the third which is a few days from now, next Tuesday, to really tell us the extent of this problem and give us a breakdown on the numbers that he's calling, you know, in the air that we need to approve for this, this, this particular exercise. Okay. I well, appreciate your time, but stay with me a bit uh, because the next issue that we're going to get into, I want to take your thoughts quickly on that. It's about the public debt. Now we have an uh, astronomical increase in the debt. The finance minister is been giving some reasons for that and i want to find out if that's justifiable but it's coming up next here on ghana tonight we continue to sink in uh, deeper and deeper in the public debt partly due to the instability of the ghana city that's according to the finance minister earlier today when he was giving the monthly updates on the state of the economy what came up earlier today, and I want to take a look at this. This is specifically what the Finance Minister, Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam, uh, disclosed earlier today about the public debt. As of the end of July 2024, now stands at 761.1 billion CDs. Quote, as of July 31, 2024, according to the Finance Minister, Ghana's provisional nominal central government debt stood at 761.1 billion cities. That's the public debt that, well, essentially all of us owe this, equivalent to $51.1 billion. This represents a nominal increase from the previous amount of 587.7 billion Ghana cities, equivalent of $53.5 billion. So take note of those two figures you see there. So, 761 billion up from the 587.7 billion CDs. That's the current public debt as we have it now, as of the end of July. Zarek Egan, according to the finance minister, the main reason for this increase in the public debt is the depreciation of the CD against the dollar. Can it just be all about the depreciation of the city against the dollar from where you sit and from what has been going on over the period? Depth of what has caused the depreciation of the city, there are numerous, you know, numerous uh, factors of which, yes, the exchange rate issue is, 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 is part of it, uh, the debt, debt here, um, of which the, the issue about the debt, as I said, the government had overborrowed. There is no two ways about that. And they cannot run away from that fact that we have borrowed and there's nothing to show for 
for the amount of money they, they have borrowed. Now, on the issue of the um, why the money had gotten to 740, yes, you can say that uh, um, the you can say that that is part of that is part of it, but that only affects the uh, the external component of the debt. The external debt is dollar debt. So obviously, if your currency is depreciated, then your debt in CD terms will become more expensive and, 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 and will become larger. So, but that doesn't apply to the domestic debt because the domestic debt, most of it is actually in CDs. So that will not be affected much unless the, 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 there's a dollar component of it, which uh, even if you are a foreign, foreign investor and you want to buy our domestic bond, you have to convert your dollars, buy it in CDs because we don't issue domestic bonds in dollars. So that exchange rate argument does not you know, hold water here. But on the external, yes, without borrowing, your external debt uh, 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 in cities could go up as a, as a result of your currency depreciating. And that is why the exchange rate issue becomes very important and mm. needs an urgent, urgent attention to be able to uh, um, keep our debt, which itself is astronomical, in check. And I do appreciate your thoughts on this one as well. Thank you very much for joining us here on, on Ghana. Tonight. I'm going to leave you to go to bed. Uh, George Kweku Rikit Hagan is member of parliament for the Cape Coast South constituency. He's a former deputy finance minister and also um, with the uh, finance committee of parliament and a, a friend of the finance committee of parliament, as he likes to put it. But there's a reason why the finance minister makes reference to the depreciation of the city having an impact or contributing to the increase in the public debt. As you've heard George Rickett Hagan talk about, it cannot just be about the depreciation of the city, reason why uh, public debt has increased from 587.7 billion to over 760 billion Ghana cities. There's something more than that because you've seen government borrowing through the treasury bills um, in this country. It cannot go externally. So there's been a lot of domestic borrowing over the period. Now, we have our part of our public debt being in dollar terms or the dollar component of our debt. So when there's a depreciation of the city, certainly you'll see the overall debt figure go up. What you're seeing on the screen is information or figures from the finance ministry itself as put together by my colleague Wisdom Suffolk on our research desk. Take a look at this. In the month of June 2024, Per the debt in city terms was 742 billion. And note this between June and August, we've seen an increase of 742 to 761.1 billion. According to the finance ministry's own data and information, if you see the dollar equivalent of the 742 billion as of June 2024, with the exchange rate of 14 cities, 58 pesos to the dollar was 50.9 billion. Now we're talking about 51.1 billion. So essentially, what this means is that there's been an average daily increase in debt of approximately 207 billion million Ghana cities, 207 million Ghana cities on the average. Or, if you like to put it in dollar terms, a little over $2 million per day in the past 60 days on the average. That's how the picture looks like right now. And that's why when you see this, it certainly uh, would complement what George Rickett Hagan is talking about, that you should be concerned as well and ask questions about what exactly is happening or what measures should be put in place to address the increase in the public debt. This is Ghana Tonight. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. When we're back, we're getting straight into matters still with the finance minister because earlier today, he made an announcement that some 700 million CDs has been disbursed or is going to be disbursed through the Securities and Exchange Commission to some customers whose monies have been locked up and some fund management companies that went down as a result of the financial sector cleanup. It's zeroed in on the Black Shield investment and I will tell you why after this quick break. Stay with us.
Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Coming up next, Finance Minister Dr. Mohamed Amin Adam has announced the release of a first tranche of 700 million CDs bailout to persons whose funds were locked up after the financial sector cleanup. That's coming up next on Ghana Tonight. The amount forms part of the 1.5 billion CDs fund earlier approved by cabinet to settle customers of the defunct fund management companies. Earlier today, Dr. Amin, speaking at the press briefing organized by his outfit, indicated that process is going to be spearheaded by the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sec, take a look. I'm glad to inform you that the Ministry of Finance has processed the release for the first tranche of 700 million Ghana cities of the additional 1.5 billion Ghana cities for the Securities and Exchange Commission to further bail out the remaining um, uh, customers uh, whose funds were, were locked up, including Black Shield Fund Management Limited customers. The 1.5 billion Ghana cities will be released in three tranches. This amount will bring the number of investors to be fully settled under the Black Shield Limited to 82,096 customers, representing 92%, and to 12,069 customers, representing 78% of the rest of the fund management companies. This will bring the total number of investors fully settled under the bailout scheme to 94,165 customers, representing 90% out of the total validated claims of 105,178 customers. Well, so that's the finance minister earlier today. And you hear him continuously make reference to the Black Shield Investment uh, Limited, formerly Gold Coast Fund Management, owned by uh, Dr. Papakosi Indom, also a GN Bank owner. Well, Charles Nyame is a convener of the aggrieved customers of Black Shield, previously Men's Gold. He's joining us on the telephone and uh, for a quick conversation on this. I appreciate your time here on Ghana tonight. I hear the finance minister talk about the fact that if this 700, what, the 1.5 billion CDs in total is released in full over the three tranches, it would amount to 92% of the customers of Black Shield being paid their monies. That's about 82,096 of, of you, the customers of the defunct Black Shield Company Limited. Is that the case? You see, as far as we are concerned, we think always the government takes opportunity of the media to just throw dust in the eyes of the people. Yes, it could be that after the payment of this 1.5 billion, 92 persons or investors of Gold Coast Fund Management would have been paid off. But let's ask ourselves that as it stands now, what is the outstanding balance of the customers of Gold Coast Fund Management? We are talking about money, which is almost five billion. So, if the amount is almost five billion, and you have released one point five billion, we are talking of a, an outstanding balance of about three billion Ghana cities. So, what the government is trying to do is that the government has selected the majority that have few or little investment when it comes to the amount. So he's trying to reduce the strength of the group by paying the masses with just a little portfolios so that the few percentage of the customers who have the bigger portfolios will, will be left unattended to. Because after the government has released this 1.5 billion, if the money is supposed to go to only Gold Coast fund management customers, we still have an outstanding of over three billion. So if the three billion belongs to the, the, the remaining eight percent of our members, what is the government saying about it? And one thing that the, the, the government has been quiet about, even on the 1.5 billion that they have allocated, 
is that the minute of them that they are going to release this 1.5 billion in three tranches. And the first tranche is the seven, 700 billion, a million that they are releasing now. The minister was very quiet on the timelines in which the remaining two tranches are going to be released. You know, we are going to an election, and we don't know where the election outcome will go. We are pleading with them that right. they should be up and doing. Even the 1.5 billion, they should make sure that they release and disperse before we get to 7 December. Okay. I, I see. So if I get the understanding... The 92% customers that the minister claims, made up of some 82,096 82, of you, um, could actually be paid if the 1.5 billion is disbursed in full. But that number represents the customers with smaller amounts of investment. So you have those with huge investments who have not been settled as yet, correct? Yes, correct. But the, yes, that is correct. But, and the right. point is, you see, even if it's left on one person, the government must treat all its citizens with an equal measure. Even if the remaining three billion belongs to one client, the government has the responsibility to make sure that that client gets paid. Right. Thank you, Charles Nyami. Thank you very much for joining us here on Ghana tonight as a convener of the aggrieved customers of Gold Coast. That's a black shield um, investment, previously Gold Coast Fund Management um, in there. So we'll track this pronouncement or this promise by the finance minister and when disbursement are made and, and when the next disbursement is going to be made. Because that's a very good question that you ask of the finance ministry and the concern that you raise as well. When the next tranche will be paid, because if it's three tranches, you want to know, obviously, if it's going to be done before the election, December 7. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we do appreciate your company, as always, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. Make some time tomorrow and join us for another conversation. There's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. My name is Alfred Okanse. This is your election command center. Do have a good night.